incredible honor that uh, I have the privilege of uh, introducing Dr. Gary Hammer from the University of Michigan. Go ahead, go ahead, don't worry about it. I apologize that I have to leave. I would like to truly stay for hours and thank every one of you personally. Um, but tomorrow's the clinic day and we have patients from all over the world who are suffering from adrenal cancer who are coming to see us. So first and foremost, um, we are here to honor Drew's memory and support Sean. I have the deepest respect for your personal and private laws, and I am truly in awe of your ability to reach out to make a difference. And as a doctor who takes care of people with adrenal cancer, this dreadful disease, you will not know how profoundly grateful I am. But I hope to show you a piece of that in the next five minutes. So who am I? I'm Gary Hammer, and I direct the University of Michigan Adrenal Cancer Program. I'm sure you're saying, yeah, but why are you here? And why Michigan? Well, for me, my journey into the world of adrenal cancer, um, as Jerry knows, ironically started with a coach, Bo Schembeck. About 15 years ago, I had the distinct honor of being recruited to the University of Michigan not as a football player, <laughs> but to, ulti to ultimately be named as the Millie Schembecker Professor of Adrenal Cancer in honor of Bo's own wife who died of this disease. And like you all at the time, Bo was incredibly frustrated at the lack of support for this disease. And like on the football field where Bo was often quoted as saying, the team, the team, the team, he committed the last few years of his own life uh, to just that. And he began faithfully building a team to tackle adrenal cancer. And I think we're here today, perhaps, to begin finishing that work. As you may know, adrenal cancer, or ACC, is one of the rarest and deadliest of cancers that we know. It's difficult to diagnose and it's even harder to treat. Most doctors have never even seen a case. And if they had, they wouldn't know what to do anyway, because up until recently, no one knew what to do. So for historic reasons, some of which I've shared with you, it's simply evolved that Michigan has become a hub of activity for the adrenal cancer community around the world. Writing the textbooks, holding international conferences, and trying to coordinate collaborative efforts with my colleague, our colleagues around the world, a handful of them, who shared the vision that one day we can cure this dreadful disease. So what you may not know is that adrenal cancer can affect the very young and even the unborn. I've seen children born with adrenal cancer. And after that, it hits kids in the prime of life and then adults as well. Like Drew, most patients ultimately develop metastatic disease that is spread throughout their body. And most treatments don't work. And the only real drug for this disease is a derivative of the pesticide DDT. And as you know, single-handedly ignited the environmental movement and was banned in 1972. Well, to this day, lidocaine, a derivative of DDT, is the only approved FDA-approved drug and the only drug approved by the European Union for the treatment of adrenal cancer. So in 2003, we decided that this was completely unacceptable and that had to change. So the problem is with the rare cancer, as you have tragically learned, is that like other, like other rare cancers, the return on investment for the government and for big pharma is simply too small in terms of the number of lives saved or the financial return on investment. For, the return is too slim for there to be any significant interest. And while I understand that's okay, uh, free enterprise society, it's unacceptable to the patients I see who are dying of this disease 
and un unacceptable to me trying to take care of them and save their lives. And frankly, I'm tired of seeing people die. What I've learned in the last 10 years is that for a rare cancer, like adrenal cancer, it's not big pharma and it's not the government that is helping make a difference. It's real people who are changing the landscape for this disease in terms of both research, advocacy, awareness, and finding new drugs. It is you, it is you, it is you, it is you. And I swear to God it's true, and I'm gonna tell you two stories to show you how profound this is that you're here today. Research at a university, and at a medical university, that's where most research is done to study a disease. Pharma steps in, oftentimes, not inappropriately, using science that's been uh, determined a lot of times at universities, and using the engine of big pharma to, to generate new therapies. The challenge is, though, at a university, um, the way that science is done is in laboratories of physicians and scientists. These laboratories are like small startup companies that are basically fueled by young students, by undergraduate students, by medical students, by graduate students. It's like a startup in Silicon Valley. That's where the creativity comes from. Now, the challenge is at universities like Michigan, or many of the universities, there's not a line item money for these students. Their funding has to come from grants. Well, where do grants come from? The National Institute of Health, which I just told you. The NIH doesn't fund rare cancer research, so you can't have anyone doing the work in your laboratory. So it's a never-ending problem. <coughs> so after Bo tried to start building a, a small team, and we have seen a few examples um, where grateful people have banded together to try to make a difference, and they have partly funded a graduate student, a scholar to come to Michigan, perhaps, and learn about adrenal cancer and push the science. Well, one of, these, um, one of these scholars in my laboratory, a young student, helped discover this one gene that ended up being mutated in 80% of patients with adrenal cancer. Indeed, in kids who are born with adrenal cancer, this is a mutation that drives the disease. So for those in the lab, uh, a young MD, PhD student worked tirelessly for five years on this project did studies in cells, did studies with genetics, took human, human adrenal cancer, put it into mice and grew cancer, and found that there was a drug for this target, this gene. And drug companies had this drug, okay? But they weren't looking at adrenal cancer, they were looking at breast, prostate, and lung, appropriately, and very um, prevalent cancers. And they didn't want to touch adrenal cancer for the reasons I mentioned, until for those published this work. Then the phone rang off the hook for a week, and four drug companies, because we had the data that showed that this mutation was important, wanted to come to Michigan and partake in the clinical trial. So in one graduate student's history at Michigan in five years, a genetic defect that was found by a student got us to not one, not two, but three clinical trials funded by Big Pharma, and this targeted therapy in a subset of patients wiped out the disease. The problem is with things like this, there are certain rules of engagement with the FDA and they demanded a certain endpoint which wasn't achieved because it was a rare cancer and they dropped the project. But we're not done yet, but that's the beginning of the story about how you can make a difference and leverage small amounts of energy through fundraising activities such as this and leverage it to ultimately get buy-in from Big Pharma or the government. The second story is simply that I had a patient who died, another person who died last year, and she used to be in pharma, and she dove into literature and said, I'm going to find a new drug myself, goddammit. And she started searching the literature and found an orphan drug that seemed to be toxic for the adrenal gland, and in two years, she founded a company, a company to try to market this drug, raised money to get uh, FDA approval to put the drug into patients, and within 18 months, we were in a clinical trial with a new drug for adrenal cancer. 
Sadly, she died seven days before the drug could get into her. So we were at Sean and Lisa's and Patrick's home last night, and we we all we agreed on a couple things that we need to. The only way that rare cancer research progresses is you have to collaborate. It can't be an island. Breast cancer is a bad disease. There's thousands of breast cancer laboratories. Adrenal cancer, I can I know every single researcher and clinician who sees adrenal cancer patients. If we all worked in silos, no work would be done. We have to work together. We it, this is intrinsically known that we have to work together, but for a rare cancer is absolutely essential. And last night as we were talking, it became clear to Sean, Lisa, and I that we actually had the same mindset that how do we better foster that collaboration and work together. To understand what's common genetically in adrenal cancer, you need to study hundreds of patients and know their entire genome, all the DNA of all 100, all 200 patients, and see what's common and see what's not common. That's how you find the new targets for disease, new targets for therapy. So we need to do that around this country, around the world, to accelerate genetic research and find these new treatments. So it's about the team. The team, the team, the team. And you're part of that. And we need to finish the work that Bo began. And that's today. Two more. Because of our work with some of our colleagues in Europe, I, I was telling the story last night, I wasn't prepared to tell the story, but a fellow that we brought over from Germany, who's a crackerjack scientist, clinician, adrenal cancer guy now, trained in my laboratory, went back to Europe and did exactly what we're talking about in Europe. So now there's a whole network of adrenal cancer researchers in Europe who are friends of ours and we work with them, but they're able to leverage what they do together in 11 countries to get the European Union to fund adrenal cancer research in Europe. They're ahead of us because we're one of the guys we train. We need to do that here. And that's what we're going to do. The first example is because of our work in Europe and here, the NCI, the National Cancer Institute, was uh, funding projects to do what we said. They were taking 500 colon cancers and they were trying to sequence the genome of 500 of them to say, what are the drivers? Because if 90% of patients have this mutation, it's important as a drug. Remarkably, even for colon cancer, they couldn't get the guy in California to collaborate with the guy in New York for Boston or Texas. They couldn't do it. And they only went after 10 to 15 of these traveling cancers. After two years, an amazing thing happened. They saw that the adrenal cancer community was a team. And they came to us and said, we want to tackle adrenal cancer as the first rare cancer that the NCI is going to tackle. Just last week, we got the first run through and we found 10 new drivers, genetic drivers for this disease that we think are going to be critical for new targeted therapy. That's the beginning. We then formed a network across the country three months ago. Beginning, put in a 500 page grant to the National Cancer Institute to begin this American network for adrenal cancer with our colleagues Sloan Kettering, the Mayo, NIH, MD Anderson, the all want to play. What do you think happened? Rare cancer. Denied. Well, that's what we need to do here. We need to develop this network. Sean, we need to do this. This is where, this is how change is going to happen. Next fall, we'll be hosting the fifth annual International Adrenal Cancer Conference at the University of Michigan. We started the first one in 2003. It now goes every, every two years across the world. I invite every one of you to attend that conference. It's open to families and patients. There will be family and patient sessions as well. We've done live radio broadcasts in the past. This time, uh, there will be advocates there, and there will be a chance for advocates to network and help change the world of adrenal cancer. So in closing, you may ask, well, how do we keep momentum alive after today's event? It's actually simple and hard. Stay engaged. Stay engaged. Keep people engaged. Stay engaged. And know one thing. From a guy who sees people die every day of this disease. 
know that you really, really are making a profound difference today. I know it because I live it in the clinic. You know it because you see your friends and family die. Know though that progress is one step at a time. It's one day at a time. It's one scientist, one experiment. It's one doctor, it's one nurse, it's one patient, one person. Thank you to all of you for your altruism and your support. It's deeply, deeply impactful. And together, I'm convinced that all of us can and will change the world. Thank you.